Hi there, thanks so much for joining for today's event. This is the latest in the Philosophy Today event series, um, co-hosted by the Philosopher and Boston Review. My name is Anthony Morgan, I'm editor of The Philosopher, um, and I thought I'd just give a very brief overview of Boston Review for those of you who don't know about their work. So the Boston Review is an independent, non-profit public space for the discussion of ideas and culture. They publish several essays online um, every week on topics including the arts, law, gender and sexuality, race, philosophy, of, uh, philosophy and science, all of it 100% free to read. They also publish four themed print issues a year, and their autumn issue is called Imagining Global Futures, guest edited by the brilliant political scientist Adam Getschu. It's available to pre-order now. Um, it is summed up as a collection of post-colonial visions for a more just world. I'll put full details of Boston Review and that um, new issue of theirs in the box below this video. Turning to today's event, the context for putting it on is the publication of Peter Vickers' new book, Identifying Future Proof Science. The book asks, I suppose, one of the most fundamental questions in philosophy of science, is science getting at the truth? Um, one of the tactics of um, skeptics about whether science does get at the truth is that those um, scientists who were quote unquote sure in the past, um, ended up being wrong. So uh, in the event today, Peter will be trying to um, defend science against this form of skepticism and will furthermore argue that we can confidently identify many scientific claims that are future-proof. In other words, they will last forever so long as science continues. Um, Peter Vickers is joined in conversation today by Jana Bacevic, um, a colleague of his at Durham University. You can find full um, details of them in the box below this video, um, along with a few other links to this or that, um, Peter's book and a few other things. So thanks very much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoy watching this event. Great. So um, the topic of Peter's book, as I'm sure you could have heard from Anthony, addresses something that has a lot to do with the way in which humanities, including philosophy, and in particular philosophy of science, have been engaging the society. And that's how we can know that scientific knowledge claims are true, correct, and most importantly, um, judging by the title of Peter's book, reliable or more likely to hold true for a period in the future. So Peter, before we start, I'm just going to ask you to give us a very short summary of what your main argument in the book is in addition to or beyond what Anthony has already introduced. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, obviously, there's a lot in there, but I mean, there what motivated me perhaps more than anything was uh, the fact that philosophy of science has traditionally presented itself as split on the science and truth question between realists on the one hand and anti-realists on the other. And it sort of projected itself to outsiders as largely divided on, on the science and truth question, or at least realists were at most 70% with anti-realists 30%, so still pretty split perhaps. But the more I've investigated my own community, if you like, the, the more I've come to realize that actually all of us or nearly all of us accept that there are at least some scientific facts that are established, even the so-called anti-realists, because anti-realism usually has various caveats and conditions and so on. Um, and I thought what we needed to do as a community was to present that consensus of opinion from within our community that although there is this realism anti-realism debate where we look split on the science and truth question there's actually a sense in which all of us are pro-science in the second in, in the sense that for example Hardly anyone in the community doubts climate change. Hardly anyone in the community doubts that viruses exist and cause diseases like, like COVID and, uh, and many other examples as well. I thought, you know, we just don't say that enough that, that, that there's, there's this pro-science consensus within the philosophy of science community. So this is the books trying to say, look, here's how we 
here, here, it starts with the, in chapter two, sort of trying to explain this other debate, this realism anti-realism debate where we look largely divided. And, and then it goes on to try and argue that when it comes to the existence of at least some established scientific facts, um, we, we are largely um, in agreement, um, even if we would adjust the list of facts differently. Um, and it tries to explain why that's the reasonable posi position, even though in the history of science, we've had many scientific revolutions. Um, which, uh, so the idea is to substantiate this claim in light of the big lessons from the history of science, which on the face of it, tell us to be very humble about what we could claim to actually know for sure. That's great because that brings me to the first substantive question I had, which is, what do you see as the value of certainty? I mean, especially as of recently, this includes the forum in the Boston Review that um, I've and alongside a lot of other people have contributed to, which was led by Sheila Jasanoff, a lot of people have argued in favor of epistemological humility. And obviously a lot of this argument, at least to me, feels like it comes from the perspective where we recognize that scientific claims about certainty have not only been at certain occasions slightly embarrassing for us or those of us who also identify as scientists, Namely, they have turned out to be wrong. And I mean, if you want to, you can uh, you can perhaps talk a bit about several examples that you do engage with that kind of fall within, within this category, but also because they create often this artificial rift between um, scientists or academics or people who have some sort of epistemic privilege and the so-called lay people or lay knowers. So in that sense, we can come across as patronizing in the sense in which if we say, well, of course, we all agree that climate change is real and is happening, or of course, we all know that this is the case, then why is it that other people do not? Or why is it that it is so difficult to convince others? So would you say that perhaps certainty is also, in a manner of speaking, a communicative strategy or perhaps even a you know, public relations, a public engagement strategy? In, in other words, how do you see the value of certainty, both for the scientific and philosophical community and obviously for those we supposedly claim or aim to engage? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll start with the certainty question. So many people react to this by saying there's no certainty in science um, and everything's fallible, everything's a theory um, and we can have more or less good reasons. The only certainty is in geometry or mathematics. That's usually the claim. So, you know, um, given a certain puzzle in geometry, you can you can show, you can prove um, with some sort of rigorous proof that such and such is the case and you never get that in science so this this is the thought um and so i'm not using certainty in that sense because then nothing would be certain um in science i mean if, if you wanted certainty in that strong sense then nothing would be certain it also wouldn't be certain that world war ii even happened i mean if you want proof in that really strong sense that you get it in maths and geometry um now there's another sense of certainty which is much more common which is just that something is far beyond reasonable doubt just take the claim that dinosaurs roamed the earth millions of years ago so this was once um, a speculation or a hypothesis um, then it became a theory at some point it became beyond reasonable doubt i think you could say that it was already beyond reasonable doubt 100 years ago but today in 2022, I would describe that as far beyond reasonable doubt, while still not proven, of course, in, in the sense of mathematics. So if you like, I'm using the word certainty as more or less a synonym for far beyond reasonable doubt. And I think there's this, this epistemic space to be explored there, which is short of certainty in the strong sense, but it goes way beyond saying this is just a good theory or you know this is our front runner theory for now you know and I think any anti-realist in 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 uh, in philosophy of science would agree that dinosaurs once roamed the earth um that you know they they would say well I'm not an anti-realism about anti-realist about that kind of case you know I'm an anti-realist 
about genes or electrons or something, but and they're typically not thinking about something that banal, simply that dinosaurs want did exist. So that's the sense of certainty uh, I have in mind. I think what is useful about it is that it just hasn't been said. It just hasn't been uh, seen as um, you know professionally sort of acceptable to uh, to explore this space. I think it's just a, an epistemic space that hasn't been explored enough. And as I said earlier, you know, it, the what's been preferred is this um, realism anti realism debate where you know we present ourselves as as two sides. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a complicated story to tell there about why we ended up going down that line. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, the I think the importance of it is simply that it hasn't been said or it hasn't been said enough. Uh, Karl Popper is still a great influence in many circles. Um, when we teach Karl Popper in philosophy of science, um, we obviously teach the virtues of, of his philosophy, but also as, as we see in many vices, um, many parts of his philosophy are, are, are considered quite strange today. Um, and so for example, you know, Popper once, once said that evolutionary theory wasn't science, it was a metaphysical research program. I think that was there were the words that he used because it, it didn't fit in, fit in with his philosophy of science. But obviously to scientists working in evolutionary theory, you know, that was, that was outrageous. It, it obviously to them was science. And they were scientists and they were studying it. Um, and then there were, other, there were other areas as well of Popper's philosophy, but, um, and one was that we can never say that, you know, something's approaching the truth or we're approaching the truth everything was always an idea to to attempt to falsify um but then on you know some of these examples show fairly clearly that that is um either the wrong idea or at least a fringe idea so you know if if, if that were your view then would still be trying to falsify the idea that dinosaurs once roamed the earth um or even that the earth turns on its axis um, I mean, people forget that that, you know, that was a hypothesis, it became a solid theory, at some point it became beyond reasonable doubt, and then eventually it became far beyond reasonable doubt, um, and today we would call that certain, the Earth, the Earth spins on its axis. Um, and that's a result that's been established by scientific labour. Um, but if you were a strict Popperian, you'd still be saying, oh, we should, you know, we, we should still be trying to falsify this. And, and in a case like that, it seems, uh, seems absurd. So yeah, that's the, um, that's the kind of background history of philosophy of science that I'm reacting to. And also a reaction to Kuhn as well. I mean, uh, Kuhn's uh, book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions is perhaps the most famous philosophy of science book of the of the 20th century um, and many people still consider themselves Kuhnians and obviously at its heart there's this idea of paradigms and scientific revolutions um, and many people who've sort of absorbed that book say well we sh you know this shows that we are in a paradigm now and we should expect revolutions in the future just as we've had them in the past um, and so I'm, I'm reacting to that as well, trying to argue in the book that at least with some things in science, we shouldn't be expecting revolutions in the future. We, we actually can. So imagine a future, you know, where people look back and say, oh, they used to they used to believe in dinosaurs. That was just their paradigm. We don't believe in them anymore. Or they used to believe smoking causes cancer. So that was just their paradigm. You know, we don't you know this. There are cases where Kuhn's sort of argument of, uh, if you like, of symmetry, you know, revolutions in the past, therefore revolutions in the future, and that we should be humble, you know, um, that can go too far or start to look absurd. That actually brings me to, well, you've mentioned several things I was going to pick up on. And of course, the legacy or the long shadow of the Popper, Popper Kuhn debate or the Popper Kuhn framing 
um, in history or philosophy of science is one of those. I think it makes sense to say that um, a lot of the discussion around the concept of epistemic humility today actually if doesn't necessarily evolve from there, then certainly relies on those arguments, reproduces them in some sort of way. And I think one of the things that you've hinted at, and I think the, the book actually does very well is in contemporary iterations, those arguments rarely actually delve into the substance of how science is done. They barely delve into the substance of what scientists believe in, regardless of whether it is the epistemic precepts of their work or the actual um, broader context in which they operate. So, or whether it, it is generic beliefs that perhaps do not have anything to do with their specific narrow disciplinary field or area of expertise. And I think the kind of the polling of people um, that tries to determine whether even anti-realists believe that some things are in effect real is, is one of, a, you know, one of the good examples of this. And it is one that, um, that I often, often also use in these cases. I would like to, to go a bit deeper into the epistemic space you have mentioned, because I think that obviously one of the, one of the core questions is in what epistemic space are these arguments and these discussions? playing out today and what does that mean both obviously for what kind of discussion your book is is aiming or intending to contribute to but also how we can make use of those arguments or related arguments or historical arguments including um, the falsificationism um, debate or legacy in the context of say you know sort of science's social life so I would start with a very broad question to you which is um, who is the primary audience? Is there a primary audience at all for your book in the sense of who does the book engage with? Because on the one hand, you do engage with the kind of realism, anti-realism debate, which is often considered a more narrowly, properly philosophical debate. Although I must say, in my experience, it is one that increasingly attracts people who are not philosophers. And often those arguments really play out on the non-philosophical uh, philosophical plane, but then again, obviously discussions about certainty or about very similitude or about um, the degrees to which we can be confident about certain kinds of scientific knowledge claims, for instance, the way that um, IPCC reports today use uh, confidence intervals, as a matter of fact, although in slightly more um, can, well, slightly, slightly more colloquial or popular parlance to actually try to argue for specific policy interventions. I think we can, we can openly say that now. Uh, that also happens in that epistemic space. So I guess you can either treat this as a very broad question or as several questions within one. And that is, how can the book speak to these different audiences as well as several others that I probably haven't, uh, haven't mentioned here? Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, I, I guess I'm hoping that it will have an impact on um, sort of a, quite a wide audience and, and attitudes towards the relationship between science and truth. So it's it's supposed to have some impact on, um, you know, um, raising the profile of, of science as a, a premier means for getting at the truth, at least sometimes. Of course, there are many, many cases where we have to say that um, we just don't know. We have a good theory. Um, it could be overturned next week, next month. Um, sometimes there's a consensus that a theory is the front runner, but um, there's not a consensus that it's true. You know, we're, we're far from that. It's just the best. Everyone agrees that's the best theory we have right now. So there, there are lots of, of complicated cases, but um the the basic idea that i mean the first and foremost that i want to put across is just that um there are there is such a thing as established scientific facts and um although on the one hand that seems uh banal to some people especially when you tell people the kind of examples you have in mind you know like dinosaurs once existed you know very very basic examples I'm not trying to be ambitious with the examples really um um the um yeah you know, i still think it's a, it's really important to try to try and have a book which establishes that there are there are such things and then we can look at 
other examples which don't try quite meet my high bar, um, such that they would count as established scientific facts, but but um, nevertheless, perhaps you know, come close in some respects. Um, so there's there's a strong consensus. There isn't an absolutely solid scientific consensus. There's still some debate left happening, and uh, one of the examples I discuss in the book is the. The, uh, the asteroid impact extinction of the dinosaurs case, where there is still some debate uh, happening in the community. Um, but, you know, you can still say that there's a strong consensus on one side. And of course, there's, there's lots of examples where there's still uncertainty, but we have to act. Um, and in those cases, we might openly say, look, there's, there's no, solid facts here to, to work with. So the scientific process is still happening, um, but at least we can say, look, if you look at the criteria that would establish it as a fact, you can see more or less, you can gauge how close we are uh, to that. So yet yeah, to start with, the audience is going to be um, a, a very wide audience, you know, ev everyone who cares about the relationship between science and truth and has to make decisions uh, based on that. And the COVID pandemic is a good example where the, for many of us who didn't think much about science, um, perhaps uh, at least in our daily, everyday lives, I mean, in, you know, someone like me obviously thinks about science a lot as, as a job, as a profession, but not in my everyday life, it doesn't come up much, but in the COVID case, it does because I have to make decisions about how to act. Um, and, and we all had to make those decisions and we're, we're being informed ultimately by a scientific community, even if that sort of went via um, politicians perhaps. So there are these cases that come up in our lives that I think where we have to make judgments about whether we're going to trust um, scientific claims and if so which scientists are we going to listen to especially if a different scientists are telling us different things and we have to make judgments so one thing um i'm hoping to do is to give people some tool tools to make those kind of judgments which are a little bit different from the tools that have been used uh, in uh, offered in the past and if you think about what we learn at school in um, you know, in high school, physics, chemistry, and so on. One thing that I end up arguing in the book is that those tools aren't that helpful because the vast majority of us don't know enough chemistry or physics or you know, biology to judge scientific claims. Um, we're not reading the, the literature. We're not looking at journal articles. Um, or if we do, we look at one or two, we, you know, we don't have time to review lots and lots of journal articles. So the shortcut, according to the book, is to um, try to judge the strength of scientific community opinion. And that's, that's a whole different set of tools that you need. Um, you need to be able to identify the relevant scientific community in the first place. Um, and depends you know, what the issue is. If it's, if it's COVID, then you don't have to, um, then the opinions of cosmologists probably probably not relevant. But, um, and then you have to have tools for trying to work out um, if there's serious debate within the community or whether there's like a, a weak consensus, which you might say, you know, 80% of scientists think that vaccines are effective or whatever it is um or whether there's a really really strong consensus you know or you know solid consensus which would be maybe above 90 percent or 95 percent um you never get to 100 percent in science um so you can't ask for that you, you know you can't say well i'll only trust when there's 100 percent consensus so in the book that's why i opt for this um high bar of 95% um, as sort of a, a useful sort of compromise between 100%, which is obviously too high, and lower numbers, which would invite uh, possible counterexamples from the history of science. But the, yeah, the basic idea is then 
to get people thinking about the tools that they would need to judge these things. So instead of trying to learn the science and work out for yourself uh, in that sort of, as, as the scientist would, if you like, whether, whether COVID is caused by a virus or something, there's this, this other, other route to making decisions, which is to um, identify who the experts are and see if there's a solid community consensus. And we don't get taught those tools at school. Um, so I do argue in the book, in the final chapter, that this ought to be part of, of, uh, of our schooling, these sort of, um, if you like, social epistemology, um, how to measure the opinions of um, expert communities, uh, which is um, not easy to do, but it's easier, uh, I think, than trying to learn all the science yourself and trying to be the scientist. Um, so there's, so that's certainly one audience. I would also mention scientists themselves because I think scientists themselves often don't know when to call something a fact. And I, uh, an IPCC author recently said this uh, explicitly, and this is um, this is published in an article. Though it's uh, the author's anonymous, but it's it's an IPCC author, and when they're writing a report about climate change, they um, if it's not yet a fact, they have to put um, in brackets after the statement um, high confidence or very high confidence. But it, if, if it is an established scientific fact, they can just state it. It doesn't have to have that qualifier on the end, um, very high confidence. So this does actually matter just for, for the way these scientists write, write those reports. And they, um, when they were interviewed recently, this, this, uh, this writer said, we could we could really do with a theory of when of when a theory becomes a fact, you know. Or, um, and also Ernst Mayer, um, a famous um, biologist, uh, once said a similar, uh, um, essentially the same thing. Or that he was surprised that philosophers hadn't come up with an account of when something becomes a scientific fact. And I just think that that hasn't been um, that hasn't really been on the agenda for philosophers of science, uh, even though it's something the scientists themselves want or, or even need. So yeah, there, there are various different audiences. That gives you an idea of, of the kind of audiences I, I have in mind. I would say now with my hat on as a sociologist, which is a hat I don't often use, um, other communities have come up with the definition of when someone something is a fact. Um, the recently passed uh, Bruno Latour, for instance, in, in his famous discussion of fact issues um, and fetishes does more or less exactly this, but it is a social account. So I, I don't want to I don't actually want to delve into that or perhaps we can go back to to how um, focus on social elements of knowledge production, especially justification and legitimation has contributed, not always I would tend to concede in good ways to the, uh, or perhaps contributed sort of fuel to the anti-realist fire or the ways in which um, some anti-realist uh, anti have managed to, to use their arguments to kind of stoke doubt when it comes to, uh, when it comes to things such as uh, climate change and I mean I had a, I had a brush with that in in some senses myself when I published this infamous article on there's no such thing as following the science after the very the very start of the of the COVID-19 pandemic whose point was obviously to draw attention to the fact that the problem of political accountability is a problem of politicians not a problem of science but some people have taken it to be an anti-realist claim in the sense of oh well we don't actually know anything about COVID whereas in fact we already knew a lot about COVID and most of these things turned out to be reliable scientific facts which actually brings me to the third kind of um, area that I was going to explore and that's you know speaking of different audiences um, this is kind of more properly my, my domain of research and interest. I'm wondering, you know, it, it does seem, I fully agree with your argument that a lot of this has to do with the fact that people are, or in most schools, people are not taught how to analyze, uh, compare, evaluate arguments if those arguments are too 
disciplinarily specific or if they are too if they require too high an epistemic threshold uh, to understand them and Elizabeth Anderson has also kind of suggested something that I think is very similar to your proposal in terms of how to determine uh, or how to have confidence in in expert expert agreement or expert around expert consensus what should be considered proper um, proper expert consensus but I'm more interested in the other side of unknowledge claims so why is it that people if we take into account that people sometimes uh, claim not to know or in some ways choose not to know choose not to believe science choose not even know what science is uh, not necessarily because um, they cannot understand it or because it's too complex or because they don't have um, the background knowledge to be able to assess needed to assess um, the validity or reliability of particular scientific claims, but perhaps because there are other reasons. And in the, the thing that I wrote for the philosopher about a year and a half ago, the epistemic autonomy and the free, free nose guy problem, I actually engaged with this and that's the problem or the, con the concept of epistemic autonomy. So whether, uh, and you know that I really like the, the dinosaur extinction example, because it's a clear one where in some ways, nothing hinges on whether someone accepts the asteroid extinction um, theory or not. So regardless of whether you believe that um, an asteroid hit was what um, contributed, if not directly caused uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs, your life will not really change much. So what would make people want to claim that this is something that they're not certain about, or perhaps you know there is no scientific consensus and so on and so forth. So how should we approach the claims or how should we approach skepticism that is perhaps not um, only, or perhaps not at all, an outcome of um, ignorance in the traditional sense, so lack of knowledge or lack of um, epistemic capability as much as perhaps an expression of a desire for epistemic autonomy or independence, no matter how, how misdirected. Yeah, I do touch on this in the book, this uh, uh, quite a few times, um, because there's this, um, this is quote from Douglas Al Alchin, that, uh, who's, who's a philosopher of, of education amongst other things, and uh, saying that, you know, they're a, a big goal of education um, for a long time was uh, intellectual independence for all. And one of the ideas behind this is uh, that, you know, we, we just need to get everybody more educated about science and then we can all benefit from, from, from that. Um, because often the problem is that people are making judgments from, from a place of significant ignorance um, and you know, we just need to improve science education and um, people can make better choices about whether to get their children vaccinated or whatever it, whatever it may be, you know, whatever the, the agenda uh, may be. Um, and what Alchin argues, and, and I, I follow this up with is, is that it's, it would be better to teach people to, trust the expert consensus I think that's what he says and that's basically what my book is saying um now why would that be the case um well it's it what my book argues that is that everyone's in the same position and this is crucial so even the individual scientist doesn't get to just look at the science and decide what it says they they themselves are just one person in this huge machine if you like so they themselves have to do the social epistemology. And they're in, in that sense, you know, they're in the same boat as you and I, um, because scientists have all sorts of different instincts. Um, some are more conservative than others. Some are mavericks, you know, some embrace ideas very early on when the evidence isn't really uh, there, um, but they run with it anyway, because they want to be ahead of the curve. We saw this in, in history in many cases. So, I mean, if you take atomism itself, for example, you've got this range of opinions in the scientific community from the ones who jumped to atomism and felt like they knew it was true straight away to the ones who lagged behind for a long time um, 
and then you've got you know some sort of some who tried to be more more in the middle um but the the idea behind the the consensus approach is that it's in the um when you when you wash out all those differences it's the community judgment as a whole that that really tells you the way to go um and it's only when the whole the whole community is sort of pulling behind an idea that you can say right they despite all the differences in that community and the scientists different political affiliations you know uh, different personalities um the ones who are more cautious the, you know the ones who are, are less cautious somehow in in despite all of that diversity in the community they've reached this big consensus and and that doesn't happen easily um it really um the looking at cases from the history of science there really has to be a huge amount of uh of evidence to really get a whole community that's that diverse to pull together in the same direction um so if it's at the community level that um you know we can trust uh, opinion then the individual scientists can't say oh you lay person um will have to listen to me i'm the expert they themselves um don't get to just look at the science and decide they themselves have to look to the community just like anybody else so there isn't this sort of big distinction between the way the lay person accesses information in other words they get told what to believe and this uh, the way the scientist accesses information you know they actually look at the, at the science it's not like that um i argue that we're actually all in the same boat um and actually scientists can make big mistakes and we've seen this in the history of science so in the book i mentioned some of the most famous quotes where some scientist has been super confident about some idea and they've said this will never be overturned and then it is overturned and one reason that's happened is because they've got one particular perspective on the evidence they've got all of those back uh, specific background assumptions which are um, biasing them in one way or another and they they they're very confident as a senior scientist that they can make the judgment on their own um but that that judgment is extremely impoverished compared with the whole community judgment so so we have these famous quotes where individual scientists often quite senior scientists come out and say this is this is for certain and then it's wrong what what is much rarer is for the whole community to to form a really strong consensus and then for that to be wrong um so so yeah i i think um you know pe people want intellectual independence um and ideally you know you would you would go and you, you you would you would get an education that will enable you to go and look at the science for yourself and make your own mind up about vaccines climate change um the link between smoking and cancer whatever it is um so that you could you could look for yourself rather than just uh, trusting somebody's judgment but i don't think um I don't think we can do that. These these issues are too complicated. We have our own biases as well. Each individual has to accept their own biases, and so, um, and so you've got biases. Each scientist has got their own biases. The way to wash out the biases is to take the the consider a judgment of a whole community that has somehow formed a consensus about an idea despite all of their different background assumptions all of their different diversity um so the yeah the the idea i guess is is to say you know um um we, we each must come to terms with the fact that we um we can't we can't go out there and make these judgments for ourselves um very reliably in most cases um but we, we can still get some idea of the science you know we can still learn about the greenhouse effect and get some sense of why the the earth is warming um but the uh, the um the details are uh, bound to uh, elude us at some point so you're doing the fact circle back to epistemic humility, which I think is a great argument because normally certainty and humility are seen as 
if not mutually exclusive, then opposing. So in that sense, I, I think this is brilliant. We have a lot of really good questions and I want to do some of them justice. But before that, I want to use my, my prerogative and ask you for a tiny, tiny comment on one of the things that I'm particularly interested um, in, um, in relation to the argument of the book, and that is this part that some scientific claims can be considered to be true and, you know, will hold as long as science continues. So what is for you as long as science continues? What, what is the caveat associated with that? What does this mean? What are the social conditions or social epistemological conditions that assume science continues in more or less unchanged or sufficiently unchanged? form counting from from today i mean i i haven't thought about um possible evolutions of the human race um um very carefully they i mean the basic idea there um i mean this won't be a very satisfying answer but the basic idea there is just you know we can we can imagine a future where scientific communities have been almost completely eroded um and in that case that community wouldn't be there to to make those judgments um, i think there's various things that need to be in place you need a large community because if you only have a small community you can have less confidence that they've they've reached this um consensus for the right reasons i mean at the limit imagine a community of 10 people they could easily all agree but um it's uh, it's not a very reliable indication of the truth if there's only 10 of them i mean that's that's just the 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 extreme but the but on the uh, th th I mean, if 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 the community is large and diverse, um, the, um, diverse in various ways, you know, different backgrounds, um, and um, you know, a reasonable gender balance, um, balance balanced uh, along political spectra as well, perhaps. If you know, that's how you kind of wash out the biases, and um, if you don't have that large. Uh, diverse community in place um with the kind of um uh, freedom of freedom of thought that sci most scientists do have today then um if that were to disappear and we can imagine you know reasonable scenarios where it it, it would be gone you know uh, a few hundred years from now then um yeah since knowledge is in the book is knowledge is linked to to uh, communities, then, um, then, then, yeah, we'd, we'd we'd lose our very best way of identifying um, truth. That's so. Uh, that's the basic idea. But yeah, uh, I haven't uh, worked out the details of that story yet. Great, and as you know, I'm very, very happy to continue this discussion in exactly in that direction. But sadly, I do have to take some of the excellent questions we have. So. Um, Starting from actually the last thing you said, um, I'm going to group two questions we have because it seems to me like they in fact address the same thing. One is the question of whether, you know, so um, Foivos I think is saying that you seem to mostly rely or provide examples from natural sciences and would you say that this applies to social scientists or social sciences as well. And then we also have um, a point from Stephen, which to me is, is very similar to this one, which basically says that, um, you know, the existing consensus about the economic political system, which I think is probably the capitalist consensus, um, can be compared or some compared to the scientific consensus in the sense in which, say, anti-capitalist thinking or anti-capitalist ideologies are marginalized. So would you say that there is an analogy or between, in that sense, social sciences or perhaps social sciences and humanities on the one hand and natural sciences that your argument would still apply to? I think social sciences are more difficult. And I think with social sciences, we don't have the kind of evidence base that I produce in the book. So that in the book, I present as evidence these examples where a consensus formed um, and then later on, we developed technologies which enabled us to look and see the thing the consensus was about and, sh and showed the consensus was correct. So an example would be continental drift, where a strong consensus formed and it met my criteria. But then later on, we, we put satellites in space which can look and see the drift happening in real time. 
And there are lots of examples like this where we develop technologies to make something observable that was previously merely theoretical. So the, in the book, it, um, I argue that in every case where we've met that, that consensus threat, that high consensus threshold, and then later on develop technologies to look and see the thing that was previously theoretical, the consensus has been correct. There's never been a, a case where we met that high bar and then the technology showed that, that the idea was wrong. That, now, this is an important um, uh, argumentative move uh, dialectical move in the book and and um when it comes to the social sciences we don't have that kind of argument uh, in place the 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 examples where um we had a theory um we met my criteria you know really strong consensus in a large international diverse scientific community and then later on we developed some technology or something which which could essentially prove the, that the idea was correct so you know and, and serve to link their consensus with truth like in the in the drift case in the continental drift case so i i don't think you can present uh quite the same argument for social sciences um but i'd i'd still be and when it comes to examples um from the social sciences uh i you know i, I struggle to think of examples but um yeah the um may, maybe the, there are one or two examples in psychology where you know there's a there's a really strong uh solid international scientific consensus but it is it's hard to think of any and um you know but it'd be it'd be something like um um depression is a gen genuine mental disorder or something um, not just a, a mood or character trait. I mean, it would have to be something uh, that's about which there's, um, but even then, I, I don't think you'd get an international consensus because uh, even the, the very terms are, are disputed, like um, the word disorder would be, would be disputed probably. So, yeah. Just going to jump on that and say, just trying to, to do justice to, to some of the excellent questions we have. Um, Virif is asking, um, speaking of consensus and your investment in, in consensus, uh, what you see as the main difference between yours and Naomi Oreskes' White Trust Science, given that um, she also, um, she focuses on consensus as a metric of reliability. So whether it is simply a philosopher versus a historian's perspective, Etc. So it can be if it if it's a yes, then it can be a one word, one syllable answer. I discuss Sovetsky's book quite a bit, and I do present my work as building on her work. I mean, I think she's done fantastic work, especially Merchants of Doubt. I think I think Why Trust Science is a is a good work as well. But there's uh, something that I think is confusing, and that Sovetsky says a few times that um, history shows that um we can't be sure about anything in science and, and that's that's always directly opposed to what i'm saying so although she puts the focus on you know consensus and she, she, uh, second order evidence approach uh, you know evidence about evidence you know um that that's my approach as well but she definitely wants it to be about um why we should trust science and and she says explicitly a few times in her work not just in that book but in in some of her scientific uh, in her papers that history shows that we need to be um, that there's nothing, nothing is absolutely for sure, and that um, we have to be extremely modest. And um, she she makes statements which sound very anti-realist, um, and and um, so in the book I do discuss her work quite a bit, and it's it's a bit nuanced because yeah. I'm building on her work quite a bit and I think you know a lot of her work is great but then there's this um what I see as a tension in her work um which is a it's very pro-science but also as many historians are many historians do take this uh, approach saying that history shows that you know we've been overconfident many times in the past and we shouldn't be overconfident now, we should be extremely modest. And um, they also like sort of a symmetry argument, you know, loads and loads of changes in the past 500 years of scientific thought, 
therefore we should expect loads and loads of changes in the next 500 years. And I do agree with that up to a point, but, but I also think that we can, we can find um, things that will, will continue and we can be confident will we'll continue into the future. Great. Um, moving on to Anne Broom's question. Um, any thoughts about the lessons to be learned from the ongoing controversies about the scope of scientific claims? For example, the Benjamin Libet claims about disproving free will. Any thoughts? Yeah, um, I, it, it's not easy to find scientific claims that I think uh, are future proof. So in chapter one, I give 30 examples, but um, they weren't that easy to articulate. I think as soon as you bring in um, claims that are more philosophical, or even, even if you just describe um, a fact or you know, a potential fact with, with the wrong word, suddenly there's this huge uh, disagreement. Um, I mean, e even with, with um, a word like causes, this is why you, you, you'd never get 100% consensus for smoking causes lung cancer, because there'd be a significant number of scientists who would say, it all de mean, mean, depends what you mean by causes, and that's a contested word, and there's loads of philosophy about what it could mean, and different theories, there's different theories of causation. So uh, you have to be really cautious, I think, with, with bringing it with your terminology, um, you know, um, even with, with what on the face of it seemed like the most innocent claim. So I think as soon as you, you know, were to bring in a word like will or, or a term like free will, um, suddenly, you know, and, uh, the, any consensus is destroyed. Um, and, um, it's the same with continental drift. As soon as you start mention plate tectonics, you know, there were debated issues in plate tectonics. But the basic idea that, you know, South America split from Africa some 140 million years ago, I mean, that I think is an established scientific fact. But as soon as you start to say anything about uh, about why or um, then, um, you know, so with, with, with every every statement you have to be really careful about the words you use to describe the uh, the claim yeah that brings me to the last two questions which i will morph and we have about um one minute to engage with them <laughs> so um yeah. one is francis's question whether realists and anti-realists agree on the facts um and francis is saying that anti-realists tend or seem to be more on the side of post-truth um, and that realists hold on to a strong fact fiction distinction. And Tatiana is asking something that I think is related, which is why I'm bringing these, these together, which is, can you clarify how scientists, what scientists can do to resist spreading falsified knowledge, like for instance, conspiracy theories, uh, when it comes to, I'm assuming um, Tatiana is referring also to scientific knowledge in a pandemic. So um, I hope you don't mind answering these two questions together, but I think they are related in the sense of, you know, do we need a strong realist claim? And, you know, is post-truth an enemy of, um, of science in, say, the context of a pandemic? Um, yeah, I, I, I sort of see myself as, as fighting against conspiracy theories, um, I guess. But yeah, there, there's sometimes a, a fine line between um, um, a case where there's a, it, it's not obvious when there's a, a diff, um, when the community, the scientific community is so small that you can ignore it. And, and when the scientific community is significant enough that you have to say that um, there's a strong consensus, but it's not universal. Um, as I say, if you, if you, if you wait for hundred percent consensus, you'll never have it. But um, there are all these cases where we've got about 95%. And, but it's in, in all of those cases, it's really helpful uh, for, the, for the consensus community to be, to be pushed really hard by the, by the small minority. And um, it forces them to work much harder to establish their claims. So um, yeah, I, I don't think I'm, I'm gonna be able to do full justice uh, to, to these questions. So I, I apologize for that. 